Hey, hey, everybody. If you're listening to this, you are listening to the first free hour of this episode of The Shift with Doug McKinty. If you like what you're hearing, please consider subscribing to the show in order to access the full feature-length versions of the podcast, as well as have access to the members' forum, where we discuss potential topics and interviews and dive deep into the overall concept of The Shift. For only six bucks a month, not only do you get the full-length episodes, but also an opportunity to co-create with me, your host, Doug McKinty, the future of the show. Go to www.theshiftnow.com or patreon.com backslash the shift and sign up today in order to help make the shift possible. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Morning, noon, or night, wherever and whenever you are listening, you are listening to The Shift. I'm your host. My name is Doug McKenty. This 88th episode of The Shift was recorded on August 13th, 2021. I'm happy to introduce my guest on the program today as Sal Mayweather, otherwise known as Sal the Agorist. His new book, Anti-Politics, provides insight into the political philosophy known as agorism, a branch of anarchistic thought that advocates market activism rather than political action, to promote the creation of a society based on nonviolence. The book is comprised of 28 short essays, including such luminaries as Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and Henry David Thoreau, describing the efficacy of nonviolent civil disobedience at toppling even the most authoritarian political system. Other authors include 20th century anarchists such as Murray Rothbard, Samuel Konkin III, and Sal himself, describing the perspective known as left libertarianism, which ascribes to the belief that the best way to fight corporatist imperialism is to simply not engage with it. The agorist seeks to exist within black and gray markets that circumvent a system predicated upon power by creating a counter system based upon nonviolence. By creating what is called a counter economy, these agorists seek to change the world one participant at a time. From their point of view, even engagement with the political system at all is a form of hypocrisy, which only legitimizes an inherently corrupt organization. Not only does anti-politics provide insight into this little-known political philosophy, but it does so in an accessible style which prioritizes action over the tedious philosophizing and economic debate that often characterizes such political texts. While this provides a great introduction to anarchist thought for those just getting into it, the quality and variety of essayists makes this a great read for longtime members of the anarchist community as well. Enjoy this conversation about agorism with Sal Mayweather. You can find his blog at www.newlibertarian.io or check out his podcast, The Agora, on your preferred podcast hosting platform. As always, if you like what you're hearing, please like, subscribe, and share this interview on your favorite social media site. We rely on listeners like yourself for distribution of this alternative information. If you want to support the show, go to www.theshiftnow.com and donate on PayPal or subscribe for feature-length episodes of each interview. Let's get down to it. I want to give a big thank you to Sal Mayweather for coming on the show, and thank you for helping to make the shift. Hey, everybody, and welcome to this, the 88th episode of The Shift with Doug McKenty. Uh, I want to welcome today Sal Mayweather. He is the author of uh, Anti-Politics, uh, a compilation of uh, agorist essays that he's just produced, uh, and he uh, runs the blog Sal the Agorist. So we're going to talk old school anarchy today and specifically agorism, which I'm excited about because it's an aspect of anarchy that I hadn't really addressed so much. Uh, I think for those of you who are familiar with my interview with Derek Rose, we did discuss it at length uh, in that episode. Uh, And he actually kind of introduced me to the concept more than anybody else, even though uh, I would proudly call myself an anarchist probably for the last 20 plus years. um, I had never really been introduced to Samuel Konkin III and the idea of agorism until maybe in the last couple of years, three, four years or so. Uh, And so I was really excited to read Sal's book and get a little bit deeper into it. And the best part about it was that it was a reflection of a lot of the issues that I have in my own personal life uh, when it comes to my relationship with the state and my relationship with uh, the the, uh, economic system that we have imposed upon us by the state, the corporate state apparatus, uh, and the questions that a lot of us, I think, have when we're confronted with, well, I got to follow all these rules and all these laws. 
Uh, I got to vote. I got to try to make change in all of these ways in politics. But agorism gives us a, a whole other option that I really appreciate. Um, and so thanks, Sal, for coming on the show. You want to just tell my listeners a little bit about your background and, and maybe give a, a initial definition of agorism? Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, agorism really is just, you know, we, we come up with all sorts of convoluted definitions for it, but really it's just the use of, of free market principles to subvert or undermine the state apparatus. Konkin defines the counter economy, um, which is sort of synonymous, counter economics and agorism are sort of synonymous. He defines the counter economy as the sum total of all interactions, peaceful interactions forbidden by the state. So other way you want to go with it. I also did um, a long episode of my show, uh, my podcast, uh, The Agora on this called WTF is Agorism, where I spent like a whole half hour answering that one question. So, Okay. Yeah, sounds good. We'll, uh, I'll put that link uh, in the show yeah. notes for people so they can find the podcast pretty easily. Um, it's just such an interesting idea. First of all, you mentioned the concept of left libertarianism. So why don't we get started maybe with a general conversation about the left-right paradigm in general, which I, I'm sure you probably feel the same way. It's kind of a waste of time. So many people participate in this whole political thing. A lot of what I talk about on this show uh, is trying to get yourself out of that dialectical thinking and into a whole other world. I mean, it, and it's uh, it's pretty close to, to the agorist principle, I think, especially reading your book. But so most people then think, and I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately too, because they peg, they, they're trying to peg a lot of libertarians as far right. Mm, and then that makes right. them instantly in everybody's mind, it goes to Nazism and all these horrible uh, horrible words and, and historical occurrences, uh, which I think is being done on purpose to get people to not pay sure. attention to this philosophy, this political philosophy that's actually based completely and entirely on nonviolence. So do you want to talk about that, the left-right paradigm, and then left libertarianism, because that seems like an oxymoron to so many people? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think that the left-right paradigm, generally speaking, is, is a fiction in the way that most people understand it today. I think that the true dichotomy is really the individual versus the state. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's just sort of speaking to the general paradigm that we have in like traditional politics today that you see in the news and stuff like that. Within libertarian circles, within the anarchist community, there's a whole nother, those terms, have, they, they take on whole different meanings. So depending on who you ask, a left libertarian is someone who's sort of like a, a a wishy-washy libertarian, someone who's sort of like an establishment or a court libertarian, maybe like a Cato Institute type or a Nick Sardwalk kind of guy. Uh -huh. I don't I don't use the term that way. Okay. So and I don't think Sam Conkin used the term that way. I think to us, left libertarian, we use that term because the original anarchists were leftists, right? So anarchism was, was originally birthed in leftism, right? Um, the other thing too, I'd say on this, on this topic real quick is that Left anarchists, and I, this is a point I make in the book, is that we prefer anti-political solutions rather than uh, engaging in the political arena. Whereas I think right anarchists have a, a higher tendency uh, to engage in politics than we do. So mm -hmm. those two things, I think, make uh, agorism a sort of left wing, <clears throat> like a classically left wing doctrine. The third, the third aspect, too, um, is that we have a class theory. Like a lot of anarchists, you know, except for the Marxians, sort of uh, throw out the whole idea of, of class. But we as agorists, we think Marx actually got it right in the sense that there is this class division. It's just not between the, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, right? It's actually between uh, the plundered class and the plunderers, right? The parasites and the hosts. That's the actual true right. class division. I think once people realize that, things become much more clear. But those are the three main things, I think, that uh, sort of pushed me to adopt the whole left-wing moniker in terms of like agorism. You know, that's such an interesting point about, about the class warfare, because, um, you know, just as I've evolved in my own political philosophy, it's become so clear uh, that there is this class situation going on. But so many people, I think because they're influenced by the Marxism, they see it as, I mean, even that term, the 1%, right? I mean, if you look at the statistics about the 1%, they're just as poor compared to the 0.01% as the 10%, you know, the bottom 10% right. are to the 1%. Like to, to, to get in this, 
you know, so much of what we get into when we start talking about politics is I think uh, a lot of the mainstream narrative wants us to fight each other. They want the 99 percent to fight the the one percent, which are typically just the the successful business owners. And then they want you know, they're looking at class. They're looking at race wars. Uh, they're looking at all kinds of different divisions, divisions between the sexes. Um, and I, you know, I know from my own perspective, it really is exactly what you said. There is actually a, a parasite class that is way above the rest of us that's not even mentioned in the mainstream narrative. And most people don't even understand that it exists. It's almost like an argument just to try to convince people that these uber, uber wealthy people even exist and really uh, pre- present the influence over the rest of our, our culture and our political activity that they do. Um, it's really kind of frustrating. I mean, do you want to comment on that a little bit, maybe? Yeah, I mean, just to draw out the point a little bit, I mean, you know, especially like the leftists and the whole idea of, of class oppression, how they don't see the, the you know, that there's sort of, it's not really left versus right. You know, we just had this big vote on this infrastructure bill with right. all sorts of add-ons and whatnot, and it was like a bipartisan thing, right? So it's not like, it, it doesn't really, it, if we're going to divide the world into classes, it doesn't make sense to separate people by the degree of success, but rather by, you know, where they are in, in modern society. I think the only way to do that is, like I said, the plundered class and the plunderers. Yeah. You know, the, the, the Marx's main point that the worker is oppressed by the entrepreneur is quite it's the exact opposite, if you think about it, right? The entrepreneur is the one who delays his own consumption in order to save capital so that the workers don't have to. Because mm-hmm. in a completely worker-owned environment, right, in a completely worker-owned co-op or something like that, the workers themselves would have to forgo consumption in order to save up money. But the entrepreneur bears that burden for them. So Marx really couldn't have got that more wrong. And I think Konkin was the one who sort of straightened that. Well, really, it was Bombay work, but eventually Konkin put the, all the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I mean, when I think about this, this upper class, and when I get away from the dialectic, I mean, I'm looking at what the left sometimes focuses on, which is the idea of empire or colonization, as right. opposed to the way Marx tried to describe it as this natural evolution as a part of this dialectical movement of history. It's just right. the, the group of guys that have stolen the most, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, when I narrow it down to just criminal activity, then it's like, oh, yeah, I mean, these guys are running a protection racket and they're using the state to facilitate that. Um, That's exactly it. It's, if you think about it, it's sort of uh, the mob of mobs, the gang of gangs is what, is what Konkin calls it in, in the New Libertarian Manifesto. And I think that's completely accurate. Mm-hmm. One of the things I, I, I tell my, my audience is that when they passed RICO in the 70s, the organized crime bill, that was sort of like the, the coup de grace for the state. That was their, their victory lap. That was their mission accomplished banner on the side of the, the ship. You know what I mean? Because now they've gotten rid of the final piece of competition because all they are is another mafia that's outcompeted other mafias. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think for a lot of us, you know, we in the anarchist or liberty community, we realize this and it's a question of, well, how the hell do we get there, right? How do we get from A to B? And that is the thing that I think, especially over the last year or two, that the the movement, this thing of ours, as Rothbard called it, really sort of has been struggling with, right? The whole concept of strategy. And that's why I'm sort of, I've really been pushing the whole agorist narrative and counter-economic narrative, because I think it's the only logically consistent way to address the problem. Yeah, I mean, that was a, a real, uh, it was a real interesting aspect of the whole book, that the practicalities of agorism, just separating yourself out and not becoming a part of this political machine, which is such a waste of time. I, I want to cover that a little bit later. I still want to delve into this kind of left-right situation, especially among anarchists. I spent a lot of time on, you know, like Facebook anarchy pages, right? Well, I, I'll just give you a little bit of my own backstory. I mean, I started out I mean, my family was Republican. I pretty quickly became libertarian. And then uh, I did some work in school with an organization called the Institute for Humane Studies. And those guys turned me on to a lot of the the older, uh, more anarchistic stuff. And Rothbard, although not Konkin, I don't, and actually I look into that. I think that wasn't a mistake. I think they were kind of promoting no. <laughs> libertarianism over agorism. Right. Um, and, and, uh, and then I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't really introduced to this, these ideas until, you know, the last couple of years or so. 
Um, even though actually my whole life has, I've, you know, I started reading them and I was like, yeah, this is exactly describes the problems that I've had in my own relationship with the state, not having believed in it for so long. And then you have all these questions. Well, do you involve yourself in politics? Do you vote? You know, <laughs> how do you involve yourself in, a, in, in the economy when you don't want to work for the corporation? Right. And you understand uh, the immorality that's going on with so much of this. Um, so agorism was a was a was a great suddenly like the light bulb. Like, guess what? All these other people have been talking about this, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think like a lot of people are are agorists or they live in agorist lifestyle and they don't yeah. even realize it. And yeah. then once they hear the philosophy, and that's one of the things Sam tells us to go do is to find the people who are already agorists and, and practicing in the counter economy and teach them the philosophy so that they can put two and two together. Right. Do you want to describe the counter uh, economy just a little bit more before we proceed so that the people have a foundation there? Yeah, sure. So the counter economy, again, it's just the, the sum total of all peaceful human action that's forbidden by the state. So we're essentially talking about black and gray markets, right? Things like, um, you know, selling weed or uh, smuggling cigarettes or any sort of action that's prohibited by the government that doesn't have a victim. Yeah. And that is a counter economic act. And by engaging in the, in the counter economy, every, every transaction that takes place off the books is $1 less for politicians and $1 more for entrepreneurs. And that's really important to me. I think that's sort of the key here is sort of to uh, starve the beast, uh, so to speak. Yeah. And if you think about it, I mean, so many people, I mean, how many people write like skim on their income tax forms every year? Oh, yeah. like, so, you know, like actually oh, yeah. many, 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 many people are engaging like, wait a minute, you know, I, even if you believe in the state, you still kind of realize when you're getting screwed right <laughs> and, 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 and you know that was one of that was one of rothbard's critiques of agorism and Konkin was he said mm -hmm. that you know this isn't really for the everyday individual right not everybody's going to go out and be able to be this you know criminal in the shadows and stuff and Konkin was sort of like our point here is that that's not what we're saying you don't have to go be the guy you know in the trench coat with the overhat in the shadows that's not the case right Anybody can go work a nine to five and then, you know, engage the counter economy, you know, at night or, or on the side or something like that. At, we all we all are agorists to a certain degree. Right. Yeah. And, and that degree is, is determined by our risk tolerance. Right. And there's so many laws on the books. Right. Everybody's breaking the law you right. know, at some point and nobody's really paying attention because everybody, I think, deep down kind of knows you know that most of it's BS anyway. You, you you can't avoid it, right? Every when you have when you go when you have a garage sale and you you know you don't you don't file you don't file taxes for something like that. That's agorism. You yeah. know when you when you sell your car to your buddy for a dollar, right? And he pays you cash. That's agorism. You know. So we all, like I said, we all engage the counter economy. It's just the the difference is a matter of degrees. Yeah, fascinating, actually, um, the more that I've been thinking about it. Um, I still want to uh, kind of conclude with this left-right paradigm stuff, because as I um, then, so I, I, I didn't even know, right, that there were communist anarchists for, for the longest time. I don't know how, <laughs> actually, I, I mean, I understood, you know, there were some guys from the 19th century, Kropotkin and, and some of the, you know, more left-wing anarchists. I just always assumed that anarchists you know, had, had, had transcended that left, right battle. And then uh, I got, you know, once Facebook came around get on Facebook, I'm like, great, I'm going to find all the other anarchists. And we're going to kind of, I mean, almost like you're talking, like yeah. I wanted to strategize a little bit, like, right. how do we live? How do we kind of try to promote the ideas of anarchy? And then I discovered that all they, all they did was argue with each other. Right. 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 It was maddening to me. Like, what are you guys talking about? And it was the same old left, right paradigm, right? The, the ANCAPs versus the ANCOMs just arguing with each other about, I mean, it seemed to me like, I don't know, like, like silly, silly stuff. And, and the communists from my mind, and this is going back to, to the idea of left libertarianism, because the communists like, like over and over again, I would run in and I don't, and I, now I don't even like to use the word capitalism. Like that term anarcho-capitalism doesn't make a lot of sense to me because capitalism is in and of itself a Marxist term. And it's already presupposing all of this historical, uh, these historical movements that I kind of think are all nonsense. I, I, I reduce, and I, I think you do too, you could comment on this, 
uh, instead of thinking about things in terms of like these larger historical pictures that some philosophers have tried to impose on, on our mindset, uh, I just boil things down to human action. Like, well, like you were talking about the individual versus the collective, but even on a human individual one-on-one relationship with someone, it's a power dynamic. Uh, and if somebody's trying to coerce you or have power over you or control you or use aggression against you, well, then that, you know, that's where I have a problem. And I can never understand where the, the quote unquote anarcho-communists would just argue incessantly about, you know, if I wanted to rent a room from somebody like, Right, right. I mean, how are you going to stop everybody from doing that so that nobody does that? Or, or if you, I wanted to trade my labor for some currency, you know, and they would right, just go yeah. off on how this is oppression and you're the capitalist oppressor. It's like, I'm not oppressing anybody. If somebody decides that that's what they want to do, that's what they're going to do. So I've, I've never really been able to understand not just the left right paradigm in, in, within the anarchist community in general, but then the aggression that I kept getting from, from the anarcho uh, communists, because from my point of view, as just a, a libertarian who believes in, in the nonviolent principle, it's like, I don't care what happens if there's not, if there's not aggression occurring, you know, it's, n- it's none of your business what somebody else makes. And, and then like, as I guess, part of my definition of left libertarianism would be, I totally believe that people, you know, can live in communes or certainly in like the idea of workers cooperative so that all the workers in a certain, you know, if you're working on a mine together, everybody gets a piece of the action kind of thing. I mean, those kinds of relationships that are voluntary that would be considered left wing uh, are something that I would completely support. So, uh, you know, the, the breakdown that left right paradigm just continues to break down. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, You know, to me, it's again, like I said, it's sort of the, the, the terms left and right have a, they take on a different meaning in the liberty community than they mm-hmm. do in, in, in most political circles. So we're not talking about your traditional, you know, neoliberals versus neocons. Right. It really does sort of take on a whole different meaning. And I think to me, it's defined by, again, the, the anti-political tactics, uh, having a class theory. And I think also the original founders of, of, of libertarianism were initially, um, or anarchists were initially, left-wing thinkers. Now, I also agree with what you originally said that we've sort of transcended that. I don't think that you can stick the blame on guys like Proudhon or, or, or Tucker or any of these old school anarchists, um, even like Emma Goldman and those, yeah. those people. I don't think you can blame them for their, their collectivist tendencies because they really, they existed in a pre-Rothbardian era. Right. So without the without the the we all are we all are sort of standing on the shoulders of Rothbard in a, in a way. Right? Yeah. If it wasn't for Rothbard, the movement would not be where it is today. We would probably still be wrestling with a lot of those questions. They would be left unanswered in terms of like the economics of it. We wouldn't right. really have a clear a clear bridge from Mises to where we are today, from Mises to to full on statelessness. Rothbard played an absolutely critical role. So I don't fault the old school anarchists because again. You know, if not for Rothbard, I probably would be thinking crazy too. So yeah, <laughs> a, a lot of us probably would. So totally, I think that also has a lot to do with it as well. You know, yeah, I know Rothbard was uh, was the was the when I started reading him, that was when the light bulb came came on for me and said, Same. "Wow, you know, these free market principles that I'd already been attracted to can just be applied completely. Like we don't need the state at all." Yeah, uh, you know, he was able to provide descriptions of like how to have a free market legal system, which is right. typically what a minarchist would be. You know, oh, here's the, the the function of government is definitely to have this legal system. You know, maybe have a fire department or things like that. And Rothbard would just have these airtight arguments like right. we can do this in a free society. We don't need, you know, how do you Better. build the roads, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, there's this there's this great video on YouTube, which any of your listeners out there who haven't seen it, I think it's called like how I became a libertarian or <clears throat> how I became an anarchist by Rothbard. And uh, <clears throat> he tells his story of, I guess he used to have like uh, these intellectual thought discussions at his house every night with like big, big names, you know, Roger Garrison, P- Walter Block, all these brilliant people would go to his house. And uh, I guess one night these, he had these left wing liberals over, you know, Democrats or whatever. And they had said uh-huh. something to him along the lines of, well, you know, Murray, <clears throat> if you believe that the market can provide goods and services so much better, why not the police? 
And Rothbard said that he had given some, you know, run of the mill statist answer, like, you know, whatever it was. But he said that that thought, that question stuck with him. And eventually he realized that in order to be consistent, he had no choice but to concede right. and say they were actually right. Right. And we, like the, they, they, the market can provide security services at both a cheaper cost and a higher quality. And when he said that, it like it, it, it went off in my head, like you're saying, it was just I had no choice to accept it at that point. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. For Logically, me, it was he like sort of forces you in, in, into the conclusion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember actually. For me, it was the legal system. I was reading. Uh, a, I, I don't even remember. You know which particular. It was an essay uh, that he wrote in a compilation of libertarian thinkers, and he was describing a free market legal system. And I was like, no way, you know. And it was like. Just like you're saying, to be logically consistent, you've got to take it all the way. And why yeah. not? I guess what? Right. We can live in a free society that's based on nonviolence. I mean, why not? This is why I say like minarchy is sort of the craziest view that you could have. It's even crazier than the socialists because right. the, minarchists, <laughs> the minarchists understand the harmful consequences of state monopolies, but yet they want it in only the most important sectors of society, right? Only in terms of police and courts and military and transportation like if it's if you really believe those principles wouldn't you want to apply them in the, in the areas where they're most important so yeah yeah well and then eventually and this is another thing that kind of blows my mind about the the sort of left-leaning anarchists and then they're the way they despise the the quote-unquote right-leaning or the anarcho-capitalists or whatever is this idea of the market they seem to despise it and i you're probably familiar but there's been a you know there's been a little bit of an uprising in the scene uh, about the blockchain thing as well like people um uh, people that are sort of on the left who see the currency markets the blockchain markets the um the cryptocurrency markets as as purely extractive and purely gambling and this and that um and then uh, you know i think a lot of us are concerned about surely the the applications of centralized blockchains like central bank digital currencies coming down the pike but um I think it comes from a deep, deep fear. And I see this from the, from the, um, the anarcho-communists as well, the hardcore uh, lefties in the scene where they just don't trust the market at all. Like they want to just eliminate it and they see it as in and of itself as immoral. And I just don't see, like, I don't see how that world can even exist. I think people are going to trade no matter what they have in their minds, like they, I, I sometimes I, I look at it as utopian thinking, right? They've created some kind of utopia where nobody needs to trade anything and everything's going to be great. But I don't see how they're, they think they're going to stop people from doing this and then having the market. And then as someone, I think at, like yourself, who's read Austrian economics and read Mises, you just come to this conclusion that like, this thing is incredible. Like a free market is just an unbelievably organic, beautiful thing that creates this sustainable system, you know, that, that allows for human progress, but ensures that each individual in the, in the, in the whole is still treated with respect. I mean, and then the price action gives so much information about, you know, how sustainable is it? How efficient is your, is your behavior? And it, allows for a friendly competition is another complaint I get. I'm sure you've heard, oh, competition, you know, we don't want to live in this competitive dog eat dog world. It's like, no, this is a friendly competition to right. determine like the most sustainable way for us to live and get the products that the people want into the hands of the people, you know? So I'm going to comment on that because again, just frustrates me to no end to know that there's so many other anarchists out there that, that don't believe in the state but still just will continue to argue because of this distrust of the free market. It really just boils down to economic illiteracy. You know, there is yeah. this post on, on Reddit and, and there's a subreddit called late stage capitalism, which is just an absolute shit show. Pardon my language. It's a disaster. Yeah. It, it's really, <laughs> it's really something else. If you ever want to like, you know, put on your hazmat suit and head into that subreddit. But this one girl said something like, the, the topic was, you know, what, what was your red pill? What brought you into, into communism? And the girl's response was that what a terrible job the public housing authorities did when she was growing up. And that's when she realized that, you know, the market was, was the enemy. And I'm thinking to myself, you realized how terrible the public housing authority was yeah. and blamed the market. Yeah. And this, I think, I think that's the, that's the, that's the problem. That's the trap. That a lot of these individuals fall into. Yeah, and I don't think it's a mistake. I think that the public schools have intentionally conflated these 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 
subjects like no the, doubt the, the private and the public sector which is really as best yet said just the voluntary and the coercive sectors they've sort of conflated them so that people can't tell the difference and you know it really is just a testament to how dumbed down the, the public is yeah you know everybody learns about socialism uh, and then when they learn about um, right-wing philosophy, it's typically like corporatism or something like nobody's teaching uh, Austrian economics in public school, right? You, you know, and, and that's uh, exactly as you say. I mean, that's done on purpose because if people don't know about it, then they're, you know, I mean, I think that's actually even a, a huge glaring, like you must be on the right track if you're reading the stuff that they don't want you to know. Like if you're getting right. into the Austrian economics and you're learning about how a real free market can work, uh, and they're not letting you know this in your public school. Like people think that Marxism is gonna is gonna, is the solution to the current the problems of the current system, but they don't question why do you why do you learn about Marxism in, in public school right. in every college course ever? And you know, like and do you not think, Murray Rothbard, <laughs> right? Do you think that the wealthy would let you learn this stuff if they really looked at it as the enemy of, of their supremacy? I'm <laughs> well, and, and that's, you know, that's sort of that's sort of the, the whole that's sort of one of the beautiful things about agorism is that, you know, you know, you talk about economics. Think about the role that the entrepreneur plays in the market. And this is something that Mises and, and Israel Kirzner and Per um, <clears throat> and a whole bunch of other great economists have stressed. But the role of the entrepreneur in the market is really magnificent. The entrepreneur is the one who allocates resources around the economy based on profit and loss, right? Just as you were saying earlier. So for us as agorists, one of the things I like to tell everybody is that, you know, not all entrepreneurship is agorist, but all agorism is entrepreneurial. And that's because if you want to allocate resources away from the government, you have to be an entrepreneur in order to do that. That's why all agorism, right, all, every last bit of it is, is sort of interfaces like, you know, whatever it is, whether you're, you're discussing, you know, smuggling cigarettes across the border or whatever it is, it always involves some aspect of entrepreneurship in some way. So that's, that, I think that's, again, that's just another like sort of roundabout proof of the theory. It's another way of verifying uh, its validity. Yeah, yeah. Just so, I mean, I do wish more people would read, um, y you know, some of these things about, about the, I mean, some of the economists that really understand how a free market can work and really have a conversation about that and learn those ideas, because I think if they did, they, they would have to come to the conclusion that, I mean, certainly it's not, I don't know, it's not evil. I, I think a lot of people get, I mean, that term capitalism has been so misconstrued like i mean like i said i don't even like to use it anymore because everybody so, as you as you kind of mentioned some people simply describe anything bad as capitalism right. i mean you know this oh this is the government did this so that must be capitalism if it's bad uh or this corporation did this and it's bad so that's capitalism it's caused by capitalism uh and it's just i mean again like i like to get away from from thinking about things in terms of the i almost feel like the left right paradigm it takes responsibility away from these people who are just acting immorally. Like, no, that's a criminal action. And those people should be punished. It's not part right. of some long-term <laughs> historical right. movement right. that they just, you know, are a part of that is causing oppression. It's like, they're oppressing people and they should be, you know, right. punished for that. Right. So right. It's almost sort of look at it as, as like politics. Yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, not, not to interrupt you, but it's sort of like, it's like we blame politics, we blame the system, but these are people, these are individuals with names and addresses. And yeah. it's like, <laughs> right. why shouldn't they be forced to pay restitution to their victims? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these guys that are doing this stuff, uh, like these pharmaceutical companies that have been busted, you know, knowing that their products have killed tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And then the corporation gets fined, but they, the individuals don't actually ever get punished for what they clearly signed off on. It's, it's amazing. It's, you know, they, they didn't pay all those lobbyists. They, those, they didn't pay millions of dollars in lobbying fees for nothing, right? Right. <laughs> it, it, it's sort of like, you know, it's sort of like, you know, Goldman Sachs, how it was, they, they sort of turned a casino into a bank retroactively in 2008. Yeah. And, you know, it's sort of like the same thing. And then, you know, going back to what you said earlier, they complain about the market and they want to prop up the state because they don't, they don't see that it's the state propping up these corporations artificially. Right. It is. I mean, that's another thing. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry. It's like these concepts do just blow my mind and having this conversation with you is bringing back, you know, some of these like, God, how do they get away with it? Like, how do they do this? It's just amazing. You, you do write in the book about democracy. 
uh, because so many people just believe in democracy and like, hey, oh, if we have this functioning democracy, uh, it's going to be great. And 51 percent of the people can, you know, can determine the, what's true for the rest of us. And we'll all live exactly. in this perfect society. And it's like and then I'm also thinking of just I, we're dealing with so many people right now who seem to truly believe that the government is is like uncorruptible. And so, you know, you've got the corporations on the one hand, which are totally out for profit. And, but thank God we've got, you know, the regulatory agencies and the government that are stopping that from happening. And there's no way that the government could be corrupt. And that, and, and it's just like, how can you possibly believe that when (laughs) just like you talked about the billions of dollars in lobbying money alone is clearly, I mean, it's in your face corruption and, and people just, you know, it's like, whoop, don't well, see it's that it. old trope. It's, it's that old trope. You know, we've investigated ourselves and we found that we've done nothing wrong. Right. It's, it's, right. it's, it's, it's <laughs> totally. absurd. Yeah. It's absolutely absurd to think that that's that's a normal way of conducting, you know, your, your affairs. Or it's, it's more absurd to think that in a, in a privatized market sort of scenario, in a market based society, we couldn't come up with a better way to to sort these people out. That's yeah. absurd. It's just a lack of creativity, lack of imagination. Right. Yeah, it's just mind boggling. Uh, let's get into a little bit the, the psychology of statism, because this is another thing that's been blowing, blowing my mind, especially as these lockdowns and all this COVID stuff has been happening. I'm actually doing a, a whole series called the psychology of lockdown to be like, oh, wow, how can people just and then when you try to argue with them. Like maybe we should be having public debates. Maybe the, you know, maybe the, the, the legislature, even, even when you appeal to people's sense of democracy, it doesn't even matter. Like maybe there should be a state of emergency and the democracy should be functioning about how we're dealing with COVID. Oh no, it's totally all right. Call a state of emergency. Now we've got dictator governors just doing what they want. Wait a minute. Didn't you you believe in democracy? You know, it's like it's like once they accept the principle that 51 percent of people can make decisions or vote on the paychecks of 49 percent of the people, then at that point, the floodgates are opened. And now you can force people to get injections. You can shut their businesses down. Yeah. You can ruin their lives. You can, you know, tell their children what shots they have to get it's at that. Once you concede a little bit of territory to these lunatics. Right. It, you know, it's, 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 it's like that old story. If you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want a glass of milk. It's like the same thing. <laughs> Oh, it's so true. And uh, I mean, I I am thinking about it. It just brings up the even the concept of democracy. It sounds so ludicrous when you really look at it that way. Like, are you saying that, you know, 51 percent of the people can murder the other 49 percent and that'll be all right? You know, and I mean, think about the position that you're holding here. And it's like, you know, Hans Hoppe does a great job destroying the whole idea of democracy. You know, he, he compares it with monarchy and hop isn't a, isn't a monarchist i'm sure you might be familiar with this but yeah. the whole idea here is that you know in a democracy no one owns the commons right so so there's no you know the time preference on the individual becomes so high where no one really cares what happens to the property it's all held in common it's really just one nightmare after another if you think about it so you know i i prefer you know Man has argued throughout centuries over the correct way to form a government. But to me, it just seems like, well, we've had governments for this whole time. They haven't worked. Why don't we try something different, right? Instead of letting the collective make decisions for you, yeah. maybe, maybe it's possible that you and only you know what's best for you, right? And only I know what's best for me. And like that, to me, it's just such an easy concept. I don't understand why people have a hard time grasping that. It is fascinating. And I've come to see it as like, I mean, I do live by what you're talking about as a principle. Like I know what's best for me. I don't know what's best for you. And I, and so I, you know, if, if I agree to let you make choices for yourself, as long as it doesn't impact me, then I can make choices for myself, you know? And, uh, and I don't know why. And then when you have, once you have that principle, then uh, it's totally, it, it, you just take it to your logical conclusion and you realize, well, yeah, I mean, we can build a society based on, on this but non-aggressive behavior where everybody just minds their own business and makes choices for themselves. And you know, what's wrong with this? Uh, the people's belief that there's some kind of objective truth that applies to everybody. And that then, you know, 51, if 51% of the people and, and, 
And that's just it. I mean, the psychology of it is even deeper than that, right? Because it's really just the state. It's really just that people are learning to think that there's something outside of themselves that needs to tell them what to do. That they, you know, like well, they don't want to make those choices for themselves because it makes life challenging, I guess. You know, it's easier to just believe in Dr. Fauci, right? I mean, whatever the authority. Yeah, it's, it's you know, uh, Friedrich Hayek spoke about the pretense of knowledge, right? The idea that like, yeah. you know, you, you the, these people are, the state can only act under a pretense of knowledge. They don't actually know what the, what the individual demands or what the market is calling for. And it's sort of the same thing. We see that into like the extreme now, to like almost to the absurd extreme with COVID. It's like, talk about a pretense of knowledge. These people are assuming they can make medical decisions for us. This is absurd to me. The, 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 and really, it really takes, a, um, it takes, a, a, you have to be a really a special kind of elitist to think that, you're, that you are so smart and other people are so stupid that you can determine what they should be injected with against their will. I mean, that to me, is just, it's insane to think yeah. that there are people out there that, like, that think like this. It is, it is unbelievable, actually. It is insane. And yet it's like infected m- most of the population where they just feel like it's all right to, to have the authority tell us what to do with ourselves. And then we're, we are the unvirtuous ones. You know, right. we're the selfish ones who yeah. are rejecting this by, by, to, you know, creating a healthy boundary in our relationship with well, the authority. You know, you know when, when we speak about the psychology of all this, right, we have to speak about the, the psychology of the oppressor, right, and, and, you know, as we are. But the other side of this coin is the psychology of the victim, of, yeah. of, of, of the tradition, your average, everyday individual, your normal sheep that you encounter in public, right? That individual is really, I mean, to be brainwashed to such a degree yeah. that they trust politicians to inject them with a needle is really something else. I don't know if I'm more impressed by the politician's ability to control people or by the sheep's ability to be controlled because it really is absolutely absurd. And, you know, forget psychology for a second, sheer ignorance and stupidity. I mean, how, I mean, just pick up just a, a very brief glance at a history book. We'll, we'll teach people if a politician picks up a needle, you go the other way, right? Take a look at what happened in Tuskegee or with Mengele or any other time that a government has started injecting people right. with anything. It doesn't right. never works that well. It is so amazing to have so many uh, examples from history of when, you know, governments are just allowed to start experimenting on people. Uh, we can, it, we can it do a whole never show just out. on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that so many people can't see it, I, I see the, you know, They've got their mainstream propaganda that triggers this fear response. And then when people are scared out of their minds and then, you know, then they're easily manipulated. And that's the thing. And they've already True. been they've already been um, kind of um, set up with that brainwashing. I mean, we could talk for a second about public education, too, which is another thing that I can't believe anybody, you, you know, that, that they don't have a problem with that, like that. It's not a problem for for the, the vast majority of people to send their kid to an institution that where you don't even really know, like who makes the curriculum. I mean, the department of education, who like some peep, some committee and some within, guy <laughs> within the department of education is deciding what everybody learns. And then that's just the truth for everyone. So then even if you believe in, again, going back to this craziness about democracy, even if you believe in democracy, if yeah. everybody learns the same thing, then aren't we all just going to vote the same way they taught us to vote, right? I mean, where's right, the, right. Where... Or if you support democracy, how could you support some bureaucratic official raining down on yeah, everybody yeah, at the same yeah. time? It's absurd. Oh man, yeah, it is nuts. It is nuts. But, you and... know, I, I I will say just real quick about you know mm-hmm. the, the Department of Education. That is sort of the, the key, right? Because if it wasn't for the ignorance of the average individual, they would never get away with any of this stuff. Right. They, they intentionally teach kids false versions of history, right. and economics. Uh, they use it to to form obedience and, and get kids in, in, away from thinking individualistically and just to really focus on the collective. That is where the problems start. And that's, I think, one of the keys. That's why I tell people one of the best things you could do if you're out there, you have kids and your listeners out there. If you can homeschool, do it. If you think you can't homeschool, you probably can't. 
Yeah. There's a great book by Ron Paul called School Revolution, where he uh, really just walks through this very nice and easily. And if, if anybody wants to learn more, I highly, highly recommend that book. Yeah, you know, and I'll just uh, speak from personal experience. We basically unschooled our children, which was kind of like an experiment. I mean, I was we were nervous about it, you know, uh, but I was actually after a few years into it, I was blown away that my kids would just learn. Yeah, you know, through right. I mean, we all we did was facilitate what they felt like doing. Oh, I feel yes. like, you know, I feel like I like this uh, gymnastics thing or whatever. I like this. I like this music thing that you know uh, this music class that i found online you want to check it out sure you know we'll we'll turn you on to a couple musicians we'll help you out uh and that was how we did it you know and and my kids over time i was like well like their reading comprehension was typically ahead of of the kids that were in school because they were just reading about the stuff that they enjoyed you know i never told them to read a book or do this or that like um but then even other things like their writing skills or whatever that we never really like their kid, the, it was just, it blew my mind. And, and let's, I mean, we can get back to the whole idea of agorism through this. Actually, we should segue back into it because, because one of the things you kind of mentioned in the book that, that gets mentioned in the book is like, what a waste of time it is to participate in these bureaucratic systems. And that's exactly what we discovered about the education. And it didn't take, I mean, the expense was nil, the extra time that we took in terms of like the unschooling even. I mean, I know some parents are, they're going to want to come up with a curriculum and try to hammer it into their kids. Sure. If you do it that way, it's really challenging, but I'm telling you, like, believe it or not, human beings, when they grow, they just absorb knowledge. And if you let them yeah. roll with what they enjoy, they're going to learn everything they need to learn to live a, a really healthy, enjoyable life. You know, you don't have to have some kind of curriculum. You don't have to force them into some kind of path that they don't want to take. And that's sort of the, the point that they make in that book, School Revolution, is that you sort of let this let the student guide their own their own uh, educational plan. And that, I think really harkens back to what we were speaking about earlier about this whole idea of central planning, right? And, and yeah, yeah. You know, how, could, how could one bureaucrat make an educational plan or a curriculum for hundreds of millions of children? That's, right. that's absurd. Everybody has different talents and strengths and weaknesses and interests and stuff like that. You know, what, what does it for one person might not do it for the other. So, you know, why should we force them to learn the same thing? Maybe they're going to have completely different strengths when they get older. So the only way to do that really is, I think, in my opinion, is, is through homeschooling. And like you said, I think mm -hmm. it's not as difficult as most people think. It really can be done. It's actually easier. And, you know, it's, it's, it's much more... Um, it's much better for the kids, not only in terms of the quality of, edu of the education they receive, but I think it was Mike Malice who said, you know, most kids, the only time they're going to experience violence in their life, most people, is at, is at a public school, right? right. Most, most times children uh, encounter drug dealers and, 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 you know, all of these things that parents are, are so concerned about. It happens in a public school. It happens in public schooling, bullies and things like that. Yeah. It happens in public schooling. It doesn't happen around their friends. It doesn't happen at gymnastics class, right? It happens in public schools. Yeah, totally. I did a, I did a podcast uh, with a guy named Donald Jeffries, wrote a book called Bullyocracy about just that, about like, this is really what school is. You, you throw your kid basically into the into this crazy social jungle with all these other yeah. kids with with hardly any parental you know or adult supervision really you know compared to the numbers of the kids that are around and it's a uh, it's a uh, you know it's like this dog eat dog world of kids and then they say you know, and then they say you know like teens <laughs> right right and then they say you know well if you homeschool your kids they're they're going to be poorly socialized right as their children are sitting in a literally in a bubble with a muzzle on their face six feet from the nearest child in another bubble, but, yeah. but your kid is going to have socialization problems. I mean, come on people. Like let's open up your eyes, use your head. I know it is, it is outrageous. I mean, it's, it's pleasant to have a conversation with somebody else that, that really just can see it. Cause it's like, once you can see it, you can't unsee it. Yeah, it doesn't work. I mean, the, the psychology that you're ingrained with in the public schools is the same authoritarian psychology that then I think is what prevents people from being able to see what we're talking about here, that a free society could actually work because it's so ingrained in them after 12 years of public school that there has to be the authority that tells you what to do. 
Uh, the other aspect of it that, that boggles my mind is like what you're talking about is a real diverse society where every individual is their own person and they're expressing their own, you know, their own path, what they're interested in. And it's so fascinating to me. I'm almost starting to describe the world as the upside down because so much of what we're getting from like the mainstream narrative is actually the exact opposite of what they're actually saying that, you know, everybody wants to praise diversity and then. They're going to talk about public education, which is just does nothing but homogenize the entire population and destroy well, diversity. I mean, well, not only that, but like without without public education, without that preparation, they could never get people this far into this whole scamdemic, right? They can never get people to shut down their businesses and to let their family members die in the hospital without saying goodbye. Like it, it really right. takes a, a strong, strong degree of brainwashing in order to accomplish that. And people might sound, think that that sounds, you know, uh, extreme or conspiratorial, but I don't see any other way that they can get people to behave this way. Yeah. I mean, and it really, honestly, if you do the research into it, I mean, you find out that they're not shy about calling it brainwashing and the, and the, right. you know, the marketing and the, the classified documents and the MK ultra program and all of the things that go into <laughs> you know, psychological operations. Yeah, yeah, if, if, right. if you tell them these things, you know, <laughs> I someone know. put on, someone put on Twitter the other day, something like, all you have to know is like two or three things the CIA has done in the last 50 years. And you're a conspiracy theorist. Right. Yeah. One of the things that I, um, I point out to people actually is that why is it that when somebody speculates on the billions and billions of dollars that are spent on all these classified operations that are, we all know are going on. But if you try to report on that right. and speculate as to what these billions of dollars are being spent on, you're called a conspiracy theorist. And no right. one in the mainstream will yeah. ever speculate on anything that's, oh, that's classified. We can't talk about that. Like what? You know, it's because they're probably the ones getting a piece of that pie in the mainstream right. media, you know? Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that actually is, is pretty interesting to me is the thought that because especially as like even the mRNA technology that they're pushing on us now, but even Facebook, I mean, even social media, even all the, a lot of this technology is coming out of these classified uh, these cl these classified programs and then like imposed on the rest of us. And it's it's fascinating to think about it, because when I think, you know, when we talk about a free market, this is a like the, the direction our, our culture goes is determined by the choices of all the individuals that are participating in this free market. You know, the technologies that, that get pursued, do you think we would pursue facial recognition technology or, you know, vaccine passports in a free society or any of the kind of technologies, uh, you know, these electromagnetic frequency waves and what they do to the human body or, you know, so many. like, is that so going to be something that, <laughs> and yet, uh, this is what they're, you know, this is the kind of thing that they're, that they're developing in these government programs. And then they're, and then these guys can determine like the course of our whole culture, our whole society from just a very handful of people that determine what technologies get developed in these classified programs. So it's just, that to me is exactly you know, that's the, if there's a yin and yang that we're discussing here, where the yin is agorism, the yang is this, I mean, it's a centrally planned economy, but even the technologies that we use, right, even the direction our culture goes, and it's all centrally planned from these few people that decide where the, and we are not even allowed to know about, I mean, again, going back to the democracy idea, well, in a democracy, we have to know what they're doing, so we can vote on whether we believe in it or not, we don't know half the stuff the executive branch does because it's all classified. I mean, how are we supposed to operate? Well, I mean, <clears throat> even in like the technology, the stuff that we do know, right? Their involvement is ridiculous. You know, there's a great book by Jeffrey Tucker called Bourbon for Breakfast. And he goes through a lot of these like silly, silly examples, like how they regulate, um, you know, how much, uh, how much water flows through your shower head. I don't know if anybody, any of your listeners traveled like to Asia or something like that. And if you take a shower over there, you'll notice a, a dramatic difference in the, the water pressure. And it's because of these silly regulations that the EPA puts on or how right. much water you can flush down your toilet and right. it's regulated <laughs> by the EPA. It's like absurd. Yeah. So, you know, think about what they're doing to the more important technologies like medicine and, and God only knows what else. Um, you know, it depends on, depending on how conspiratorial you, you want to get. There's some really crazy stories out there of yeah. their involvement in a lot of the development of a lot of this stuff. But to me, you know, the one, the one thing that sort of 
ends the debate here, ends the discussion in terms of technology is the whole thing about nuclear, right? We see, look at how the market uses nuclear energy to try to bring power and light and heat to poor people and, and to underprivileged people and to try to expand, uh, you know, this global energy grid in mm -hmm. a clean and renewable way. But look how the state uses nuclear energy, right? They use it to kill life and to, to obliterate people. And that just goes to show you like the different ways that, that the market versus the, the state uses it. And the last thing here is you're exactly right. It's, it comes down to a matter of centralization of technology, right? Um, we as agorists are trying to change that. So you look at like something like um, central bank digital currencies, which you had brought up earlier. That's a very centralized project. But if you look at the sort of counter to that, these decentralized blockchains yeah. or, um, uh, you know, uh, centralized verification services like banks, whereas, you know, we have these, you know, peer to peer minor networks or, uh, you know, they have the SEC to in the FINRA, you know, processing securities and, and, and uh, uh, exchanges and stuff like that. We have tokenization and stuff like that. So we are going to decentralize everything. And um, that's sort of the whole point. And one of the, the keys of agorism is to look for these centralized structures and to sort of disintermediate around them. And I think that we're, we've made a, a hell of a lot of progress between 3D printing, uh, blockchain, um, all sorts of things. The internet has been a huge tool for us. So mm -hmm. my point here, I guess what I'm trying to I'm sort of rambling, but what I'm trying to say here is that they're going to use the technology for bad stuff, but at the same time, we're going to be able to use it for good stuff. Right. I, I see this a lot too. I mean, we've, again, I brought up that whole, this whole blockchain uh, conversation because some uh, have seen the central bank digital currencies coming down the pike and then just simply said the blockchain you know, the, the, right. the whole technology is, is terrible. Uh, I think a lot of people feel the same way about guns, you know, guns kill people. It's terrible. Uh, right. it, it, I mean, and, and I, and I just like the way you described it. I mean, I just have this uh, belief that these technologies are tools and it depends on how they get used. And, and actually uh, I think that the tools that are the most beneficial can also be the most harmful. So that's kind of what right. you're playing with, you know? And it's like, yeah, the blockchain technology is, is can be terrible if it's used to, to for data collection. And if it's used for privacy, then it can, you know, say it can really be the savior of mankind. It can help everyone, uh, you know, protect what they create online, especially all the, the content creation that's going on that's now basically Absolutely. having to be given away for free. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if I could make a little something every time somebody watched this video, Absolutely. you know? That and would that's, <laughs> that's that's one of the amazing things that we're doing with tokenization right now, right? So whereas, yeah. you know, uh, I call this technological accordism is a term that I've slapped on it. But like, cool. if you think about it, right now, if you post something on any of the major social media platforms, you're not getting paid. Mark Zuckerberg is getting paid based on the popularity of your content, right? Jack is getting paid yep. or whomever. Exactly. But if you look at like these tokenized platforms, like say like minds.com or, or something like that, or steam it or float or whatever it is. I don't even know. I'm not sure about float, but like mm -hmm. on these, Rock these platforms, you get paid uh, in tokens based on the popularity of your content. And then those tokens, which are native to the platform can then be traded or, you know, Convert into BTC or Litecoin or Bitcoin Cash or Ethereum, yeah. or they can be, or they serve some sort of auxiliary purpose. Like in the case of mines, you can boost your content. So we are slowly getting to the point where we're going to tokenize this content in order to get it out of the hands of these, uh, you know, centralized legacy platforms that, of course, are engaging in fascist censorship on behalf of the state. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, even the internet itself has been cent centralized um, because of, of state regulations and even, sure. even the energy production, like we were talking about. I mean, I think that energy production would be something that would be done, uh, you know, at a house by house basis. Everyone yeah. would have, you know, a couple of uh, solar panels, a couple a windmill on the top of their house, you know, a couple of different ways that they were generating their own. I yeah. saw this uh we yeah, and we should try to get back into into focusing on the agorism concept. But I I uh, was in Russia. I worked in Russia for a bit. This was uh, around uh, just after the transition. This was in like ninety five, and uh, I was in this uh, city called Magadan, which was called the gateway to the Gulag. And they had actually Magadan. This is an interesting story. Magadan had grown because the you know all the prisoners would go there and then they go out to the different gulags or whatever. So it was like a central hub for the Soviet system. And it had at one point hundreds of thousands of people, but it was a fake city. It was made by 
the communists. And so when communism fell, like most of the hundreds of thousands of people left, and there were probably still 30 or 40 or 50,000 people that lived there, but the infrastructure was built out for 500,000 people, and it looked like a ghost town. It was outrageous to go wow. through this place. But one of the things that they did, one of the brilliant ideas they had, because it was cold up there, right, was that they they had a big tube, and they had a central heating facility, and they had like centralized uh, air conditioning or heating for the whole city. And they had a big tube that would just pump hot air through the whole city. And it's just another example of like, what a dumb idea when everybody in the United States knows that you have your heater in your house, you know, you have your own appliance. And so many of these things have been centralized. We think of it as normal, like having a centralized uh, electricity grid, which is, I think probably just as ridiculous as what was going on in Magadan with the centralized heater that would heat the whole town, you know, because that's what, made you know jp sure. morgan rich back in 1908 when they first started building out the grid so that's how it got done it, it, you're absolutely correct um and, you know again that goes to just you know like you said about the whole concept of like centralized planning it's absolutely absurd that they think that something like that would be like a good way to meet out energy production but if you leave anything that you put in the hands of the state you're going to find the most inefficient way to get that job done so i'm not yeah. surprised yeah yeah, it's fascinating. And again, so challenging to understand how the average person doesn't really see uh, how they've gotten caught up in it. And in fact, are willing to defend it like to the end, the Stockholm syndrome is through the roof. Um, <sighs> and like you were saying before, like I think the, the oppressor has just learned to, um, y- you know, they, they basically uh, have this relationship the oppressed have this relationship with the oppressor where they, they, you know, it's like a symbiotic relationship. They need it. And they don't realize that if they just turned on that light bulb, they could be free and we don't have to deal with this anymore. Well, that, that's one of the points I tried to make in in the book here is, is, is just that. And I think that's something that um, I start the book off with Etienne de la Botte, because that's, I think that that's the first point that he makes is exactly that. You know, once once you realize that you are free, then you are free. And again, I think uh, later on in the book, that's something that Tolstoy says, right? I think Tolstoy makes the argument that the Indians had actually enslaved themselves to the British yeah. because it's they who who came to understand and respect violence as the sort of, uh, uh, you know, kingmaker, or so to speak. So it's like, it's in a certain extent, I think that's a really brilliant argument because in agorism, we do the exact opposite. Once you understand that you're free, you are free. Or if you think that you are a slave, then you are a slave. So it's, you know, which side of that do you want to fall on? And to me, obviously, the answer is clear and simple. Yeah, it's such a fascinating concept, actually. I mean, that's why uh, the state engages in all this psychological uh, understanding and psychological warfare and propaganda, because they could never survive without at least a large enough percentage of the population really believing in them. And then the population actually polices itself. Just, I mean, like Tolstoy was saying about India, I mean, the number of, there were what, you know, a hundred thousand Britons in India that were managing that, that whole thing. And there were a billion uh, Indians that could have easily at any time just said, you know, and, and that's what they did, right. That's what Gandhi did. And you have a couple of Gandhi essays in the book as well. Just saying, you know what, let's let's just say no. And then, boom, the British could do nothing. They could do nothing without the mindset of slavery, like without the individuals convincing themselves that they they need to be enslaved. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's sort of like the key to to understanding anti-politics. That's why I started with with La Boutique, because that Mm -hmm. really is the whole foundation um, to to anti-politics and to agorism, because. You know, that's one of the, the primary benefits of, of agorism is that unlike any other anarchist or libertarian doctrine, agorism offers people instantaneous liberation. Once yeah. you understand that you are free, you are free. Once you understand, you know, it's sort of like um, being a sovereign citizen, but the sovereign citizens are very confrontational. They have a very short lifespan because, you know, these are the guys you see on YouTube. Right. You know, they get pulled over for a seatbelt ticket and they have a shootout with, you know, the state <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great, but you're not going to live a very long time. So it's, rather than doing that, be the gray man. 
right? Blend into the backgrounds, right? Understand risk tolerance. And that's the way that you can actually be free right now without waiting for some politician's permission. Yeah. Well, um, I really appreciate the work that you've done. I really appreciate the idea of anti-politics and the book anti-politics is out. Um, one of the, one of the things I really enjoyed about it, even though like I, I've actually been pretty well versed in a lot of these ideas over, over the decades, uh, I was still introduced to a few new people, uh, and the essays are nice and short. So you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be an economics nerd. Like we were talking about to, to start to be able to understand what this is about. It's, it's nice. And it's, um, like, again, not only for a kind of a veteran like myself, uh, was it a really pleasant read and I got some new ideas out of it. But if you're new to these ideas, it's just the perfect introduction, not super complex, but it really drives home, uh, you know, the foundations, the points, the ideas behind agorism and some of the conflicts that have been having uh, been having in libertarianism over time. Um, and if you're going to be a libertarian, if you're going to break the chains of oppression and you're going to free your mind, then the book talks about all the issues that you're going to run into. Like, should I vote? Sure. Right. <laughs> should I vote for Ron Paul or should I participate in politics or so you want to let people know uh, where they can find out more and uh, and. Uh, where they can find your podcast too. Yeah, of course. Um, the book is anti-politics. You can find it on Amazon. And like you said, I wanted to keep the chapters, the sections short and sweet, try to make it flow nice for everybody. I wanted to make it very easily, easily read. So yeah, um, it was sort of designed that way, but uh, yeah, again, the book is anti-politics. It's on Amazon. There should be an audio book coming out sometime next week within the next couple of weeks tops. And uh, the podcast is the Agora. The blog is newlibertarian.io. And of course, um, I also own 3dprintergobrr.com, B-R-R-R.com, if you want to buy 3D printers for cryptocurrency. And Agora Threads for any sort of anarchist or libertarian apparel or merchandise. Very cool, Sal. Very cool. Thanks for coming on and having this conversation. It was, uh, it was really, it. thank you. Yeah, for sure. It was really nice to, to get back and put my anarchy cap back on and, and uh, dive into some of this, but it's so important. Um, and it's easy for me with this podcast. I, I cover a lot of different issues. So, but it's nice to get back into politics. And this one was especially re- refreshing because uh, more and more, I 100% agree with this idea of agorism that really, you know, just drop out of the system, people, you know, don't even pay attention to it. We can build our own world uh, on the black market. And that's how we're going to eventually, you know, take these guys out. There's no way that we can do it playing their game. Right. I mean, so much time, so much money is spent on all of that. So, yeah. All right. I'll just let people know that you've been listening to The Shift. I've been your host, Doug McKinty, and you can find out all my stuff at www.theshiftnow.com. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. The best place right now is my personal page on Facebook, uh, which seems to be evading the censors more or less. <laughs> I think the podcast page, I mean, it's hammered, but just look up Doug McKinty on Facebook. And I actually uh, have got quite a group of friends that have a, have a good uh, conversation. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter at D McKinty. And uh, I've been promoting my Odyssey. If you want to catch the videos, uh, the Odyssey, odyssey.com backslash the shift with Doug McKinty is a place to go. And I'm on Rockfin too. So people should check out the Rockfin site. Actually, it's a great place to find uh, a lot of good information these days. Uh, and if you buy the membership, you get everybody's premium premium uh, content. Uh, so it's a really good deal uh, and a lot of great information there. So thanks everybody for listening. And thanks a lot, Sal, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Great conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yep. Have a good one. All right. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, my conversation with Sal Mayweather. That um, was really fun one for me. It's uh, it's nice. I've been uh, sort of identifying as an uh, anarcho-capitalist, if you use that phrase, but more and more uh, with this agorist label for uh, quite some time. So it was fun for me to be able to have a conversation with a fellow anarchist and especially someone who... Um, has really been focusing on this concept of agorism because it was a branch uh, of the philosophy that I've been wanting to delve into since my interviews with Derek Bros. Uh, and so to get to learn a little bit more about it uh, was a was a kind of a, a refreshing gig for me. Uh, and then to be able to have that conversation and really th- uh, thrush out that idea to really understand what it means to call yourself agorist. And I, I actually think I've been living a lot like an agorist for most of my my life, my adult life. Uh, you know, doing a lot of side jobs, staying under under the radar as much as possible, 
um, and I, I'm not really wanting to participate so much in the political system. And when I have, I've noticed exactly what Sal is talking about. You just get bogged down. Hours and hours and hours of policy discussion. Uh, almost always about the most boring subject matter, frankly. Uh, and then, do you ever make any kind of substantive change? I mean, clearly, it doesn't work. I mean, even if you win uh, an election kind of process, like how much long-term change are you really making? Uh, how much are you able to fight this corporate government system uh, and really make change against it um, by engaging on, on these, you know, in these community political battles? Um, it just doesn't happen and you can spend a lot of your life doing it. So this tactic, if we really just talk strategy, the tactic of just leaving and doing your own thing, I mean, I think it just might be the way forward for a lot of us. And one of the things that he uh, he discussed is how has social change ever been done? You know, always it comes from the people by just changing their lifestyle, by just not participating. He talked about uh, cannabis laws changing. Why do you think they changed? Because most people were smoking the stuff anyway. I mean, come on. They couldn't stop it, so they had to change it. And we could do that with so many things. We could do that with currency right we could do that uh we could do that with education i think that's coming up i mean as we're seeing our society get more and more segregated right i think agorism might become the only solution for uh, those of us who don't participate in the mandate process so uh, a, a real timely conversation at that and another thing that i wanted to mention because this has been something that's been on my mind for a long time is that i've noticed that a lot of con quote unquote conspiracy theorists are uh... start off are sort of self-described anarchists or anarcho-capitalists or, or or very very supportive of, of minimum uh... government and i think that stems from what uh... sal and i were talking about at the beginning which is about how once you start to contemplate a world without a state or a world without uh, an entity that has a monopoly on violence, which really is a protection racket, right? <laughs> uh, and once you stop giving that, that organization legitimacy and you can start to analyze it from sort of outside of itself a little bit. And I think I, I discussed a little bit with Sal at the beginning how libertarians or even as he described it, the left libertarian we have a certain set of principles about how you need to treat other human beings in a nonviolent way. You have to respect their individuality. You can't force anything on their person. You can't uh, not hear their words. You can't censor them, right? We have to pay attention to everybody in our communities. Uh, and we can't, we have to give them bodily autonomy and we have to allow them to make choices for themselves about their personal lives because this is what it means to live in a free society. If you don't have those principles, you are a slave. You're just doing what you're told. Uh, and always by a hierarchy, which is in, invariably at the top of the hierarchy, is an upper class, a wealthy class, like he described the predator class. Um, and so it was always interesting to me, and I think it is because once you really hold on to these principles about um, individual autonomy, anti-slavery, abolitionist principles, the fundamentals, and you apply those principles, uh, then you've got to come to the agorist conclusion, right? You've got, and you start to be able to see that uh, not only do few people ascribe to those principles, but then the people at the top, instead of becoming people that are legitimately using authority, when you see violence perpetrated against another free human being, you see it as a criminal act. And I mentioned that to him, and we had a little bit of a conversation about how, you know, one of my issues with Marxism is that it, 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 um, it seems to absolve the upper class of the criminal behavior that they're engaging in when they're centralizing the means of production by saying this is just an inevitable capitalism, part of history, got to wait till the, uh, you know, until uh, the next synthesis of the thesis and the antithesis, and then we'll have the end of history and it'll be communism. Uh, no, these people are committing criminal acts and they need to be stopped. Like, we're not ascribing them uh, the, the ethical 
ju- judgment. I don't. I, I steer away from the term judgment, but maybe in this case, it's pretty applicable. I mean, clearly there are very wealthy people that have a lot of control uh, over the governments, and then impose that control to amass uh, more more wealth through the centralization of the means of production. I mean, I, I, it just becomes something that you can see once you apply the principles uh, of individual autonomy, the principles of anti-slavery on everyone, right? <laughs> you give everybody uh, equal access to their own personal power, uh, and you give them the respect to make those personal choices for themselves. Uh, and so that's when you know, you kind of break the spell of statism. I've been uh, looking at it a lot as a, almost a cult indoctrination that people believe uh, that the people at the top of this hierarchy uh, ha- should be allowed to have authority over them uh, as a kind of an indoctrination. They believe that the state uh, has this authority and does good, but I don't see the evidence that it's doing good. I see the evidence of criminal behavior from the, from the top uh, all the time. Uh, and so, but when you bring it up, people want to th- perceive it as part of the democratic process or part of this political process that they see, they don't see the corruption inside the institution. They don't see the, the ethical breaches. Uh, and, and so uh, that's what I wanted to talk about because it has been something on my mind. Just noticing a lot of people, Derek Rose, James Corbett come to mind, uh, who are very libertarian in their perspective. And then they really start to be able to see and uh, I did like what Sal was discussing as well about how so few people do see the parasite class, like where Marx got class uh, class wrong in thinking that it was just the entrepreneurs that were oppressive. But above the entrepreneurs, you have the the uh, the parasite class, as Sal called it, uh, that are feeding off the government, that are controlling the central banking apparatuses, that are literally skimming off the top of the entire colonial empire that their families in many cases have been building for hundreds of years. And once you understand that there's this class above, uh, you know, your your rich uncle or your wealthy family member that uh, started a small business that was pretty successful and now they have a few million dollars or whatever, you know, those people shouldn't be uh, thought of as the enemy. They're not the ones that are centralizing the means of production into this massive corporate apparatus. So... Uh, It was cool to have him on and cool to be able to really discuss all of that. Um, Just one final note on all of that. It's like when I I talk to a lot of my friends, uh, especially my progressive friends who lean Marxist or are very leftist, uh, and I try to explain to them, you know, it's just so funny to me that I go through this process where I totally do agree with them on... Uh, the fact that there is this uh, predator class and we're engaged in a, in a class war. Um, but then when I go to describe the methodologies used by this upper class to centralize the means of production, just as Marx discusses, and you would think this would be a left-wing idea, I instantly get flagged as a conspiracy theorist. Like they simply don't believe that rich people get together and collude in order to solidify their wealth and power, which to me is just common sense. I, you know, like again, I go back to this idea of, of indoctrination, statist indoctrination, rather than, I mean, like if you can't see it, another thing is the corporate capture of things like the CDC and the FDA. How do you not see? You think these things are, you know, they're government employees and they have are the people's best interests at heart. And it's like, can you see all the money that's flowing from big corporations into these? three-letter agencies, and then the technology that's flowing out of them into the corporations. I mean, so anyway, I mean, just, I could go on and on, of course, but I hope you, that you uh, really get the gist of this about agorism, and I want to do want to take a second to plug Sal's book, Anti-Politics. I did love it. The essays are short and sweet. It's something you can pick up and just get a little agorism for a few minutes, put down, and you know, come back to it when you feel like it. The essays are, are really that short, you know, 10, 10 15 minutes a piece. Uh, but they um, they really do contain the kind of concepts that provide a really good introduction into uh, the concept of anarchy and the concept of agorism in particular, and especially uh, the idea of civil disobedience um, with a lot of great essays by the likes of Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Henry David Thoreau. So excellent read, and I also urge you to check out his podcast, The Agora. I'm going to start listening. Uh And uh, you can find all of his stuff uh, at www.newlibertarian.io. That's Sal the Agorist at newlibertarian.io. So please urge you to check that out. 
Again, the book Anti-Politics is on Amazon, good for uh, the novice who's just curious about anarchist ideas, but also I think, I know I got a lot out of it as well, uh, just because there was such a variety of different essays, not everyone uh, I had read before, so it was nice to get new perspectives. Um, so, um, recommend that book, Anti-Politics, to, to all of you if you enjoyed this conversation. So, I'll just let you know you've been listening to The Shift. I'm your host, Doug McKenty. And you can check out all of my work, including helping out the show on PayPal or think about subscribing for the feature-length uh, episodes that I put out for members. It's only 6 bucks a month. Go to www.theshiftnow.com for all of that. And really, I, I give away most of my stuff. It's under the free content tab. Uh, you'll see um, over 200 interviews uh, place there at this point going back for the 10 years that I've been doing this. So uh, please go to the website, check it out, and just sign up for the newsletter and I'll keep you appraised of everything new coming out of Doug McKinty Studio. So thanks again everybody for listening and uh, we will catch you on the flip side. Take care. Mm-hmm.